Um, all right, so we got 200. Let's go ahead and kick this. Um, like I said, more or less, this is going to be like a once a week thing where I take a Dragon Soul Heroic boss, we break it down initially, just go through all the abilities, uh, you know, what they do, what they actually mean, you know, more so than just reading them in a journal. And then after that, we're going to go through a couple of videos that I have picked out that I want to show you guys. And then um, I will explain as the video is going, uh, you know, what's happening, things like that. And, um, you know, have some parses that I can show you guys uh, that from our uh, from our runs, and then you got, and then we're going to open it up to, like I said, uh, you know, eventually it's going to be like really structured where you guys will, you know, will already have a pre-planned person picked, and uh, you know that person will have logs, videos, and all that submitted, and everybody can just like sit here and just watch the one-on-one -on -one interaction and listening to what they have going on compared to what they're having problems with, and you know. It's so basically a learning experience for everyone involved, you know. Um, with that said, yeah, let's get down to it. All right, so this phase, we're talking about Warmaster Blackhorn on Dragon Soul Heroic, okay, 10 and 25. We're going to do both. Um, it's two-phase fight, more or less, and you, if you guys are on WoW, you can open, the, open up the dungeon journals and just more or less go along, uh, follow along here. Um, stage one is basically the, you know, the boss isn't active yet. There, is, there are... Um, the boss drops two ads down in the middle. One is a Twilight Dreadblade, and the other one is a Twilight uh, Elite Slayer or some shit. So you basically the Dreadblade. One thing to quickly note about him is he does a cleave, which will put a shadow dot on players. Um, you can disarm him, and that's uh, one thing that we'll get into whenever you're collapsing for the large uh, soaking things. You want to try to disarm him, but you know. Let's just get through the abilities real quick to make sure everybody is on the same page as far as those go. All right, the two ads that drop down, you got the, like I said, the Dreadblade and the element, the Elite Slayer. Um, you also have Twilight Sappers that are dropped off uh, throughout the fight. Those can be Death Gripped and Stunned. Those are the only forms of CC, well, and Slowed with Chains of Ice and things. Uh, Frost Shock, whatever. Um, the biggest key is, like, whenever those land, you don't want to use CC on them right when they land. You want to wait till they reappear because they cloak and then reappear about midway through the ship. Those are imperative to kill. They do a lot of damage to the boat uh, whenever they hit it. Um, so you've got the two melee adds, the sapper, and then you've got two drakes on each side of the ship. Uh, those are both the same, uh, same names. And uh, we'll get into positioning and how you want to assign DPS on those. So those are all the mobs that you're going to encounter in Phase 1. Again, it's a two-phase fight. Uh, there's three sets of each ad. All right, there's, there's three sets of two melee adds, the Dread, the dread Blade and the Elite uh, lead Slayer. And there's three sets of the drakes uh, that the range kill or whatnot. And there's uh, the sapper will come out um, during each one of those. All right. Uh, so that's all of those. The harpoon guns that it mentions here, these are more or less just uh, time things. They harpoon the drakes and then pull them in. And then the melee can also help out on those. And uh, An added mechanic to the heroic portion of the fight is you have deck fire. So if you guys have done it on LFR, you've done it on normal. Uh, one thing that is going to be added once you get to Heroic is there is Deck Fire. And if you guys didn't memorize last expansion, it's very similar in that regard. Uh, there are, um, the more damage the ship takes and just periodically throughout the fight, it seems that uh, fire spawns at some point on the ship. And the more damage the ship takes, the more fire spawns, etc. So, yeah, you want to... Um, Make sure that you're soaking as many of the... There's two different types of barrages. We'll get to those. But uh, the deck fire is caused from damage that the ship takes. Um, Gariona. This is the large dragon. And when she shoots the deck, there is, uh, you know, the large one that the entire raid has to stack in. Uh, outside of that, let's see. Yeah, that's the one I just covered. Twilight Onslaught. That's the name of that. And then... Uh, broadside, she periodically unleashes, um, it's basically like a soft enrage or whatever you want to call it. She, the longer that you're in the fight, the more she's going to do damage to the ship. And that's, there's nothing, there's not shit you can do about that. Okay. Um, so the only real big thing you need to worry about with that dragon is, uh, the Twilight Onslaught. And that's the large one that you stack the raid inside. And right, moving on, Twilight Assault Drake, this is the thing you're going to put the range on. Uh, there's two of those, there's... Three sets of there's three sets of two, 
and what they do is they drop off the melee ads and they also um, spit little bitty barrages on the boat that you're going to need at least two if not three people in to soak them. The only person that can soak them solo are things like an AMS DK, uh, you know, somebody with a cooldown, a tank or things like that, but you want at least two if not three people inside the little barrages. And on Heroic they put a debuff on you that keeps you from just soaking back to back even if you're topped off, all right? You're going to take multi, you know, a lot more damage. So the key is, you know, just strategically soak and we'll get to that. So um, like I said, the Dreadblade uh, and the Elite Slayer, those are the two melee mobs. Don't need to get super in-depth on them. They hit not that hard. They have a charge that is uh, outlined by a line on the ground in the direction they're going. And then they, uh, the degeneration and the brutal strike. It's a debuff they put on each respective tank. That's why you switch tanks every time that they spawn. So like the first, the first time they drop, uh, your first tank will pick up the Dreadblade, your second tank will pick up the Elite Slayer, and then the next set they swap, all right, and then, then vice versa. There's three sets of two. Um, Twilight Sapper, I already went over that. Uh, the Detonate uh, does 20% of the ship's ability, so that is phase one in a nutshell. All right, quick rundown, drop off melee adds, three sets of two of those, ranged uh, drakes, three sets of two, and then the Sapper. So have to have the whole raid with a cooldown up to soak the large ones. Uh, you know, to anywhere to two to three people to soak the small ones, and outside of that, just blow up melee adds and the drakes and get into phase two. A lot more in depth, but we're just trying to get the abilities out of the way. Once you hit phase two, this is a lot different on heroic. Instead of just DPSing the drake and the drake leaving, you now have the drake land, and you're gonna have to get the drake to uh, I think it's like 20 or 25 percent, and then she leaves. Okay, so um, it's basically you you phase change it. The uh, tank that you're going to have pick up the Drake picks up Blackhorn first, and then you switch to the Drake and things like that. Um, there's no real new abilities on um, the Warmaster in Heroic other than the Siphon Vitality, but uh, you don't really worry about that because you, you're not really putting any damage onto the boss. Uh, whenever the Drake's down, you just nuke the shit out of the Drake until the... Uh, until she flies away, all right, you, you don't, I mean, it, basically, the whole reason that it's in Heroic is to keep you from ignoring the Drake, because it doesn't hit that hard, you know, and it just does a breath and shit like that, so it, it basically forces you to kill the Drake, because if you just burn the boss, it's going to uh, just uh, heal, okay, um, outside of that, I mean, he does hit harder and things like that, uh, a couple things about the Drake, when it's on the ground, um, she's going to put a healing debuff on people, um, and she's also going to uh, do a Twilight Breath, and whoever's tanking that, it's a cone, obviously, your traditional dragon shit, face it away from the raid, AMS, or, you know, div pro whatever, uh, mini cooldown on that, it's not that brutal. Um, let's see, am I missing anything else? Yeah, Twilight Flames is the thing she shoots on the ground, that's why you got to get her on the ground ASAP. Um, and Consuming Shroud, this is the healing debuff. Uh, it's 150,000 healing. Yeah, so it's not that much. Just have them run out, heal through it, and then get them back in the group. Okay, um, so that are all, that's all the abilities for Phase 1 and Phase 2 on Heroic, um, from the Dungeon Journal, and then we're just more or less going to open up some videos and go through each one of those. All right, so, uh, I'm going to go ahead and tab over and open chat for what you guys have, and is there anybody that has any questions about like any of the abilities before we get into more or less showing how the fight is done uh, r in real time? Uh, are hunters good on this fight? No, not really. Oh, they're not bad either, but they're not like, oh my god, get hunters. Um, roads are pretty good, depending on how you tank the ads, we'll get into that. Okay, so, where does this, when does the fire spawn exactly? Uh, it spawns every, like, thing, it's either 20 or 25%, and then outside of that, it's just based on the damage that the ship takes, alright? Um, so when the healing and debuff in phase 2 has to run out, or they stay stacked, uh, I think you can do either. Let me go look at this one more time. Uh, we have them run out um, for that. It's uh, uh, 
Yeah, you could probably actually have them say sacked or whatever. Uh, we just have them run out and then heal them up and then they run back in. Um, but that is honestly a really trivial part of the fight. Uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to link this video for you guys and you guys can more or less uh, follow along with it. And, um, you know, we're just going to skip through here real quick. So, going to full screen this and leave it on... 720 to keep it from being a buffer nightmare. Okay, so the way that we, this is our progression kill, and uh, we're the we actually killed it legit. You know, there wasn't any uh, super shady shit like pulling the two melee ads into the cabin and cleaving them down to keep them from charging people. You know, there's none of that. I mean, this is a straight up legit kill. Uh, as you can see, kind of the way that we had it set up is you see the square, the triangle, uh, the X. Okay, those are just uh, three. There was also three additional camps, two more behind the, to the right of X and to the right of Triangle, and then one more. To, it's basically we had uh, six camps, all right, three on each side, and um, it allowed for uh, the best soaking that we could do. It was six groups of four, and we had quadrants assigned for people to soak. As you can see, both ads land. Uh, and we pulled them into our quadrants, like right here where I'm looking at. Uh, before that thing actually charged, it's more or less like a okay, pause it right here at 32 seconds. You can see pretty much everybody's in their quadrants. It's like I said, six quadrants. You've got the X, where the star is, where the triangle is, where the square is, where the circle is over there, and then the uh, diamond is somewhat out of position. They should actually be over there near the moonkin. But uh, that's more or less how, or they, they just moved. So that's more or less how we did the fight. We blew up the, uh, or how we handled the soaking, rather. As you see the, the things landing on the ground, that's one thing that you want, it's really imperative to uh, soak all those to eliminate as much deck fire as possible. Now, I will point out that there is, the deck fire is almost somewhat, it's almost RNG related because sometimes you can soak your ass off and, you know, you end up falling behind on fire as well. So, I mean, there's no specific formula to it. I just know that the better you are soaking, the odds of you getting less fire uh, are, you know, it's it's it, your odds are more favorable. And you're going to have people that argue, well, this is how it works. But, I mean, trust me, we've, we've had pulls where we soaked literally almost every bit of the fire and we had just fire overwhelming the ship. And we've had pulls where we didn't do a good job at all soaking, having to, you know, people weren't in place, people weren't topped, having to avoid, let the ship take damage. And there's literally, you know, very little fire on the, the deck of the ship when it comes down to it. Um, and then there's also strats where you can uh, just completely avoid soaking altogether on 25 man and uh, burn drakes. And then the fire can sometimes be somewhat controlled at that point too. So, I mean, there is somewhat of an RNG element to the fire. Just understand that you're not hurting yourself by soaking. You're doing nothing really but helping. Okay. Um, the way the, depending on how your DPS is, is going to more or less depend on how much of the Twilight Onslaughts you're going to have, these large ones that hit, okay? Uh, basically what happens when these come active, you get the entire raid to, to go in. Uh, we desac the first one, and you can see here I vamp blood on the raid, you can see the graphic. Everybody gets in. The way it works is it splits damage between everyone, and the ship is also included in that. So if it was just you soaking, it would split the damage between you and the ship. If it's you... Another person in the ship, it's splitting the damage three ways. So the ship, just remember, the ship always counts as a person, all right? Like, just because you're in there soaking it with one person doesn't mean the ship isn't going to take damage. It just means that you're going to half damage with the ship, okay? Um, so like I said, you're going to get anywhere between five and six of those total. Pro tip for that is you want to basically have cooldowns active, all right? So if you have a prop alley in the raid with four-piece, desac being every two minutes, that's pretty key. Uh, you know, just any type of mitigating cooldowns, a prop warrior uh, with their shield wall every two minutes, they're, gonna, they're not going to need it for tanking these adds. Um, if you have a uh, Feral Druid, theirs is a little bit more taxing because it's a three-minute CD. Uh, Unholy DK is really good for that due to AMS, or I'm sorry, AMZ. And you guys know how AMZ works is if it's only going to take one burst hit, AMZ is really, really good. It just sucks against, like, steady buffets of damage, all right? Because what happens if it's just one hit, you're able to drop it, and the entire raid, it takes that hit from the entire raid, all right? It doesn't. That's just how it functions, if that makes sense. Um, 
you don't understand that, ask me later. We'll get in more detail, all right, with how AMZ works. But it's really good for this. Okay, and uh, having druids rotate roars coming out of these is really key because one thing that happens a lot of the times when you collapse is you're you're going to run the risk of the two mobs just doing quick charges, and you can't really see because there's the fucking, you know, Friday night disco on the ground where you've got healing circles, you've got the, uh, you know, you name it, dude. It's like the amount of graphics that are on the ground when you've got 25 people, you know, uh, on the ground plus that purple shit swirling. I mean, you're not going to see anything. I don't care who you are unless you've got some graphic setting that allows you to, you know, reduce all of the healing effects and only see enemy effects and if you know how to do that let me know because i would be interested but anyways like i said one thing you're going to run into a problem with i mean you could stack for these you get as many people in the raid as you can however you need to have a cooldown up whether that's powered barrier whether that's am whether that's it's just something that's mitigating all right spirit link totem not so much but if you don't have anything else go for it uh things like that uh if you're looking at this from a raid leader perspective you need to more uh, more or less view it as, you know, you're going to be in the first phase for more than probably four, five minutes. It just depends on your, your, your DPS, all right? But um, you need to plan your cooldowns out for every single one of these large ones. And have it in a macro, and you spam it. That was key, you know I mean? I'm not saying you have to figure it out. Have your healers do it, whatever. I mean, like, our healers uh, come up with our cooldown rotations for them a lot. You know, ours is, like, D-Sac, Barrier. Uh, you know, AM's only on a two-minute cooldown. If you're ready with two or more Holy Pallies, that shit is up for almost literally every one of them. I think it's every, uh, you can do it, like, one, then you miss two, and then you do another one, things like that. But not going to harp too much on this. It's just a very key component of the fight. You have to get the raid stacked. You have to have a cooldown up. Little things that you can do to increase your odds of not fucking dying during this are you have... Uh, you can have rogues disarm the dreadblade, and you can also um, use roars when you're leaving, because that lets people get back to their quadrants, let them start soaking quicker, and let them move out of charges quicker, okay? So, that's that. As you see, it happens. We all move back out. We get in our quadrants. A lot of this is just discipline and communication, all right? Like, sticking to your quadrants, telling people who's going to soak, things like that. The Drakes, if you if you have to make a prior, I'm going to pause this. If you have to make a priority list on, like, what you want to prioritize DPS on, the paramount, pri I mean, like, without question, the number one priority for your DPS, melee included, okay, well, depending on your strat, but yeah, are the Twilight Drakes, the shit that comes down from the sides. Because those are what's shooting the barrages at your ship. Those are the quicker those die, the more the range can help focus on the melee ads as well. So, I mean, that is definitely priority. The way that we did it initially wasn't really optimal for melee, but we had, um, we're going to go over some more strats. You guys can see it. It's doable this way. The way that we did it facilitated, this, this strat that you're watching here is nothing but facilitating maximum soaking required. You know what I mean? Like, this is a strat that you want for... Uh, maximum soaking. Now, there could be tweaks and uh, things like that made, but this is what we went with, and this is what we got the kill, uh, the kill with. So, uh, moving on. So, you see the ship's going to get uh, damage done. You see it's in the back there. We're finishing off the melee adds. The sapper's back out. It's gripped. It's killed. Okay, then you've got downtime. Um, going in before the second, you should be completely clean. You don't ever want to have overlap between ads. You need to have the melee ads dead prior to the new ones coming in. Now, optimally, the way you want it is you want the melee ads, the Dreadblade and the Elite Slayer thing, you want those dying as the next ones are landing. I mean, like, best case scenario, I mean, sure, you want them dead as soon as possible, but as long as you can keep up with that, you have the DPS required to get through the fight. All right, so that's more or less your benchmark. If you're falling behind to the point to where you have melee ads up when new ones spawn, you've got a problem, all right? Now you've got a problem to the point to where you need to adjust something, whether it's comp, whether it's strat, whether, you know, if you have four melee adds up, people are going to start dropping. They're going to start dropping really quick, all right? So um, get everybody used to the timing. 
once the second uh, onslaught's landing is right about the time that the second set of mobs is landing. Okay, and you can see here that we have a barrier for this one. Both tanks pick up their ads. And then everybody gets back in their quadrant. All right, so we're going to walk through this video uh, and all that stuff. You see the charges going out. There's little icons on the ground. They're just a pain in the ass to see. There's a recent change to make them a little bit more visible. Another key thing, I'm going to pause it here. Another key thing that people need to understand is it's important to soak everything, but it's not like imperative to the point to where you're going to risk dying, okay? If one or two or three or four or even five or six total of the little ones hit throughout the fight, completely okay. You're going to make it, all right? But you, what you don't want to have happen is you don't want somebody going Johnny Rambo like, oh my God, I'm going to save the day, and then expecting someone else to be reading your mind and thinking that you're going to soak that. It needs to be planned out, and the way we did it with communication was we had each group make binds to each other and mumble. That way mumble just wasn't a clusterfuck of everybody screaming, I got this, ignore this, blah, 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 blah. You know, it's just um, you have an idea, okay, we're going to soak the next one. We're going to ignore the next one. We have the debuff. You know, it's just very, people need to understand before the icon is on the ground if they're soaking that or not. That's imperative, okay? So that said, moving on. I just need you guys to understand that it's important, but it's not, you know, you're not going to wipe if a couple hit the ship. All right, so this is the second set of melee ads that are out right here. This is the third onslaught that we get. We get everybody in here. We have another barrier because we had two priests for this fight. Okay, you see the fire is getting pretty ridiculous. Now, another thing to note about the fire, I'm going to pause this again. Another thing to note about the fire is the fire is bad to an extent that if you stand in it, it's going to kill you. But if you need to run through the fire to get to a to get to an onslaught or to get to a sapper to kill it or whatever, you need to understand that the fire is marginal damage. I mean, it's not going. To, you're not going to walk in the fire and just fall over dead. If you need to run through it real quick, run through it real quick. Don't ever be that person that's like. Well, I couldn't get around the fire. Run through the fucking fire, okay? Like, don't be an idiot. It's not going to kill you. It's not like a one-shot, you know? So if you're only going to be in it for one or two seconds, you can make that. You can run into it to stun a sapper. You can run into it to grip a sapper. You can run into it to soak a big one with a cooldown up and then run back out, you know? It's not going to be that big of a deal, all right? So moving on, this is the second of three sets. When the fire's in your quadrant, you just have to do your best to, you know, hug it, but not be uh, inside of it. Okay, now we have the third set of ads coming down. We have, you just heard it called out in the video. This is a spirit link for this one. We run in. We grip the sapper to us, because there's fire all back there. It gets stunned. And we run back out. You can see charges going off. It's a really, really shitty part right there because everybody's so the problem with fire being all over the ship like that is everybody's just so like uh what's a good word crammed i guess everybody's just crammed up in an area okay and it just makes it really really rough with everybody crammed up that close a lot of people are going to be taking charge damage some people are going to be taking cleave damage some people i mean like there's just a lot of damage going out then soaks hit a lot more people things like that and I see people asking how the fire works. All right, I wish they would have allowed one or two raid members to drive the bots that put the fire out, but unfortunately they didn't. And what happens is the bots basically are automated. And sometimes they do a very good job of putting fire out, and sometimes they do a really shitty job of putting fire out. So to answer your question is, it's completely automated by the AI of these water bots that run around and shoot water on the deck. They can run around and shoot water on the deck and it does absolutely nothing, and sometimes they can run around, shoot water on the deck, and it nukes the fire like that, you know. It really is, uh, to an extent, RNG. Um, you just want to soak, as, like I said initially, you want to soak as much as you can to avoid, uh, to avoid as much fire as possible. And, uh, you know, biggest thing is, you're going to be able to do it regardless. Just do a good job avoiding the fire and working around it, all right. So... Uh, yeah, let's go ahead and play this here. This is the third and final set of melee ads. And you can see it's getting really, really hairy right here for us to the point where 
People are probably, I think we have a few people die within the next, uh, yeah, we had one person die right there to the charge. It's just poor play. Um, we phase change the boss right here, and we can pause it, and you can look at the amount of fire that we have on the deck when we phase change it. Okay, one thing to be aware of, if you guys can see my mouse, you know, if we get one more large one, there's a risk that it could be back here where I'm moving my mouse around in a circle. There's a risk that, I mean, any open part of the ship is where it's a uh, fair game, all right? And, you know, it's just, uh, that's complete RNG. Um, you could have your whole raid push into a corner that's wide open down here, and the fire, or the uh, Twilight Onslaught be picked in the far corner. For that, you just got to use roars and get there uh, and things like that. But, uh, you know, some pulls are a little bit rougher than others. Uh, but for the most part, it's pretty controllable. All right, so what's, what happens here is we're, we phase change the boss. We killed all six, all three sets of two Twilight Drakes. Once you have those down, um, the, the RP starts and it goes into phase two. Now, going into phase two, you're going to have one more large one to soak. Usually going into that, sometimes you don't, depending on how quickly you push it. And you're also going to have one more sapper, okay? Uh, depending on what HP the ship's at, it still takes damage from the sapper. It's always a good idea just to grip it in and nuke it. You're going to have two melee adds up going into the transition, uh, unless you outgear the fighter or something like that. I'm talking about like for progression, you always had two melee adds up going into that phase. What you want to have happen is you want to have one of the tanks pick up, um, pick up both of the melee mobs, and they get focused down while the other tank goes and picks up Warmaster Blackhorn. All right. Uh, so that's more or less what you need to be. Your tanks have to have that worked out going into this phase. You need to identify which tank is going to tank both melee mobs, and you're going to figure out which tank is going to pick up the boss. And before long, the drake is going to land, and when that drake lands, both melee mobs have to be dead. So that's your benchmark for this fight, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and play it. We're going to go into the phase change here. Well, this is a really rough pull for us. We got really, really, quote, I mean, we, I don't know, we played good, but we also had some luck involved. I mean, because... Usually when the ship had this much fire on it, on a phase change, it was just, it was rough, man. It was rough, but we, we made it happen, and as you can see as this video unfolds. Um, so what happens here is we have two melee mobs up. Absalom, our prop paladin, is the one who picks up the two melee mobs here. Uh, I pick up the boss. You can taunt him before he even hits the ground and start building threat on him. Uh, and, it's, and also DPSing him, much uh, much more importantly. Uh, you can need to start DPSing him. Um you know, as soon as possible. But you also need to understand that the DPS on the boss is not as important now as getting the two melee mobs down and uh, getting the drake on the ground and then back in the air to fly away. All right, so here's our phase change. We have the boss on the ground. I pick him up. You have both melee mobs up. One's at 22. I think the other one's at 48%. So, I mean, it's pretty rough there. We've got a lot of fire on the ground. Um, and we just have a sapper land. Okay, so... There's not going to be any more soaking involved. There's no more onslaughts. There's no more barrages. None of that shit. All right. So basically from this point, your priority going into the phase change is to nuke down the the two melee mobs as fast as possible. And you're going to, you're, this is the only sapper you're going to have. The last sapper comes down as you phase change this. So just nuke that sapper down real quick. It's only got like 1.5 mil or something like that. Uh, not a lot to put into that. Just focus it down. Get back on the melee adds. Uh, and wait for the dragon to land, okay? So as you can see here, you see all the bots uh, flying around. My timestamp right now in the video is 321 if you guys are following along. Uh, a few new people joining the channel. I'm going to go ahead and link this. This is a video, and like I said, if you want to follow along, 321 is where we're at. Uh, we're going to hit play. You see the water bots putting out the fire. Okay, these, uh, the way the disrupting roar and things like the way the boss works in general, he does a higher amount of damage the lower he gets. So initially, all his physical attacks and things like that are um, lower damage. You want to save cooldowns and stuff towards the end. But with that said, uh, you've got to get the Drake on the deck as soon as possible, and you've got to get the melee adds down as soon as possible. So there's a lot going on right here, and it's the key to winning this fight. Phase 1 is just really all about soaking and communication and cooldowns. The this is the hardest part of the fight, is transitioning from Phase 1 into Phase 2 and getting to the point to where it's only the boss, all right? So this, like, 2-minute, you know, 90-second time frame is where you're going to make your money at, all right? So we're going to play again here. 
We're getting the melee mobs down. You see it there. It's at 25 percent. Shock waves are going out. You just got to have people play well right here. There's no real like system in place. Just don't get hit by a shock wave. Don't uh, you know? Don't get. Don't stand in the purple shit and don't stand in the fire. The ship will clean up. The cl the ship will clear up. You just have to live. All right. That's the biggest key here. As you can see, once the boss or once the uh, dragon lands, you now have the dragon down there, and you now have Warmaster both, okay? You're going to have to have a tank on each, okay? So what you want to do is the person who is tanking both melee adds, once those die, he's going to tank, he's going to taunt Blackhorn off the tank that picked Blackhorn up, and that tank goes to the Drake, all right? Because that tank's going to have one or two Sunders, worst case three already, depending on his RNG of avoiding, and... That tank is then going to move to the dragon, who doesn't hit nearly as hard and just has a breath, okay? So if, uh, a death knight's really good for this uh, because of its control mitigation, things like that, and uh, also AMS for the drake. So what happened? We've got the melee adds down, the fire's cleaning up, the drake landed. So we're going to go ahead and play and watch this come about. Okay, the tank that gets the drake. You want to have them somewhat close to each other to, uh, you know, maximize DPS to an extent, but like I said, boss damage is zero priority altogether, all right? You don't want any damage focusing on, you know, the boss because your priority at this point is to get the Drake to die. And what I mean by die is I think it's either 20 or 25% it takes off and you don't have to worry about it anymore. It's just you and War Master, all right? So as you can see, the little worker is doing their job still. That fire is going to get cleaned up completely. Right now is the tank that picks up the Drake, number one priority, get threat on it and get it turned away from the raid to where it doesn't breathe on someone because it has a breath that's a cone. The way that we choose to do it, uh, Abs taunts the boss off me and then I taunt the Drake and I just tank the Drake over here. Uh, I have a circle uh, on me and you can see where I'm standing facing the Drake and then the melee on the Drake and the ranged R2. Alright, so we're going to go ahead and play. You have the roar coming out. That's just raid damage. It doesn't really, I mean, if you're too close, I think it interrupts you as well. So as range, you've got to be away from the boss. You don't want to be standing right next to War Master. You're just going to get locked out for a bit. So you need to be 5 or 10, 15 yards. This is when you want to use Lust. Heroism, whatever applies to you. Like, this is the point in time where you need to use your all your cooldowns because getting this transition down is paramount. It's, it's so key, all right? Uh, go ahead and play. So you hear me bitching at people to use health stones and things like that. Okay, you got a shock wave. Everybody runs out of that. Uh, you see Dats who got hit by it. You see how much damage it does. It just uh, annihilates people's health that early. So, I mean, later on if you're getting hit by it, you're going to die. It's that simple. All right, like I said, the healing debuff goes out. absorbs 150 healing. 150k, sorry. Uh, you see the boss is still at 95%. That's good. We're just nuking the dragon, trying to get the dragon to go up. And you're going to make a tank switch at this point, okay? You can't just have the tank stay on the Drake the entire time and the 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 tank tank the boss the entire time while the Drake's down. You're going to have to make one, if not two, tank switches, all right? So what you want to do is a tank, a super, like, uh, a key point that you need to, you need to be watching that breath timer because what you don't want to do is be like, oh, herp derp, I'm going to run over here and swap real quick. And you run over to pick the boss up and... During this time, the boss is the Drake is facing the raid, and then just nukes the entire raid with a breath. It's key to switch between breath timers. On the flip side of that, if you're tanking the Drake, it is imperative that you look at where the boss is and make sure that you understand if Shockwave is on you, you need to move because if you take a Shockwave while tanking that Drake, you're pretty much going to die. So I mean, there's while you're tanking the Drake, you just obviously your normal tank rotation, but you need to be vigilant of two things: the the breath that the Drake does and the shockwave that the boss does. All right, depending on positioning, those can be harder than others. Um, yeah, so go ahead and play here. We the way that we way that we did it right here is we have the entire raid grouped up right here. The fire's gone. You can see the reason we have everybody grouped up is for group healing. It's just so, super easy and efficient to get people topped. You don't have to waste. Uh, you don't have to waste time, nothing. I mean, you can get people top super quick through uh, healing circles, you name it, chain heal, whatever. Um, the way that we were handling the shockwave is we were having our ranged move in a direction, uh, and there's multiple ways to do this, and you'll see for some other videos. Um, 
you have the range move in a predetermined direction and just restack. It's just it's more efficient. Instead, I mean, ultimately you could have 25 people encircle the boss in their own, you know, in their own circle as long as it they're not standing in front of the the breath of the dragon and the shockwave is only going to hit one or two people. But it makes healing extremely rough, getting people topped off extremely rough. That's why you kind of need to stack. Okay, so I would highly recommend stacking and just moving as a unit. And we, you can hear a taxis in the video. He's more or less calling out what direction we're going to go when the shockwave hits. All right. So you're gonna, I'm gonna play it here. He just got done calling out. We're gonna go left when the shockwave, uh, if the shockwave is on range. Another thing you need to line up is you don't want to have the melee directly in front of the ranged. You want to have a triangle. That way, if the shockwave is on the ranged, the melee don't have to move. If the shockwave is on the melee, the range don't have to move, if that makes sense. That's very efficient, and you definitely need to do that. I mean, you could even split the melee into two camps because it's super easy for the melee to move because it's a cone, and the melee are on the, you know, the very tip of the cone, which is the least amount of movement possible. So the biggest key is you want to have as little movement as possible for as maximum, maximum DPS output. All right, so go ahead and play here. Shockwave coming up. There it is. It was on me. I'm. Uh, I moved. It doesn't look like anybody got hit by that. Um, so the range just got to sit there and keep nuking without stopping. You see the breath went. Now Abs comes over here, taunts the boss, and then I go over there and taunt the dragon in between breaths. So that's the way that you want to do it. The boss should not move. The Drake should not move. All right. And that's just going to be on your tanks. The, the, the tank that's picking the boss up doesn't need to taunt War Master until he's standing directly on top of the tank that currently has him. And then as soon as that tank has it, the other tank taunts the dragon and then just spins him back and it never, nothing ever moves. All right. So then we're going to keep going here. You can follow Sunder Stacks here. You see Shockwave. Everybody runs out left except the Moonkin who just got hit. That is... Uh, whatever, I didn't see who that was. It was definitely a Moonkin. Um, here we do another tank switch. The uh, thing's starting to hit a lot harder. We need to have the, dra the dragon down, like, soon. This is pushing it, like, I don't even know why the boss is that low uh, as it is. We should already have the boss higher. I'm assuming just through melee cleave and things like that. So we just let this play here. All right, boom. There we go. We get the drake. We get the drake down. It flies off. Um... As you can see in our video, our ship basically transitions with 60% HP. So we did a really good job soaking and things like that. And you saw how horrible the fire was. Uh, so, I mean, that's even doing a really good job soaking um, the, the ship still had that much fire on it and whatnot. So the Drake flies off. You're done with the healing debuff. You're done with the breath. You're done with everything. It's just you and the boss, just like it is on normal and LFR at this point. But everything is just amplified and damage and all that. So you see me, I just got comboed with the Disrupting Roar, Center Stacks, and a Devastate. And then uh, you, you probably, you're going to have a tank die at some point in this phase, so it's pretty pretty helpful that you're going to have a tank res. All right, everybody knew which way they were going to go for this. The way that we did it once the, dra the, once the dragon left is we split, um, we split the range into two camps. I see a question in chat. Why not have all the DPS stacked directly behind the boss? It's because if you have the range DPS stack near the boss, they're going to get interrupted. And uh, that, uh, what's the thing called? I'm horrible with names. I just know what I'm talking about. It's, 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 uh, I mean, I have to look it up. One sec. It's called, uh, I will tell you, the Disrupting Roar. Yes. If, uh, yeah, the shot also interrupts spellcasting for 10 seconds, 10 yards for 8 seconds. So basically, it's, uh, if you if you have your range stacked behind that, you're more or less just castrating them because they're just going to keep getting interrupted. That's why you have to have the range behind them, okay? And the pull, like one or two pulls before this, we hit in rage, okay? And the reason we hit in rage, we came, I mean, well, obviously just being, you know, undergeared the first week of content to an extent, and obviously just being unfamiliar with the fight, only having seen it for one night, uh, you know, and things like that, we more or less decided to to eliminate movement, but not 
make it completely ridiculous, we were going to split into two range camps instead of just one, okay? That way one range camp could just keep nuking while the other one was moving. And we were going to do that until the boss gets to a low percent HP and then recombine to get people to top off quicker. Okay, so that's what you saw right there. I'm going to go ahead and replay that. You see a stack for the shockwave. We have, a, we have an X group and we have a square group, and they split left and right. And I'm going to go ahead and play it, and you can watch it. All right, here we go, shockwave, and then boom, X goes right, square goes left. As you can see, Affinity gets hit with a shockwave there. Uh, looking at this optimally now, hindsight obviously being 2020, you would probably want both people to be on the edge of the healing rain. Um, that's kind of what they were doing here, but you can see a few people uh, were a little outside of it. So um, the key, what we're going for, like I said, is you want people in as many different, uh, as many different groups as possible to minimize movement. Okay, Move, more movement equals less DPS. That's a mindset that you want to have going into progression pretty much at all times is you want to, as a raid leader as a strategist as just a raider in general you always need to be looking at what is the most efficient way for me to do this without moving because movement is a loss of dps okay so that's the reason we split into two camps i'm gonna go ahead and hit play here they got a res on me with some rebuffs uh we had a healer die so that was really rough for us all right um i think we take like one more um we take like one more roar and we're like, yeah, look, we need to get we need to get restacked because, you know, we just can't keep up with the healing with them split. We didn't have a lot of time in this phase. This is like our third or fourth time seeing this phase ever. Okay, so we're just kind of learning on the fly and making quick decisions. Uh, so you hear one of the healers. So we got a shockwave here. We get out of that. Uh, you see Bob. He got hit by it. Okay. You got the. Uh, the disrupting roar go off. We, we're not really doing a good job getting people top because we have a healer dead. That was really key. It made it a lot harder on us this pull, but we ended up pulling it off in the end. Uh, we have you see Nadri dying to just taking uh, avoidable uh, avoidable damage and things like that. Same shit. Uh, nothing new. All right, so moving on. Yep, you just hear the healers are basically like, we can't keep up with this healing. Um, we need to get back in one group. Okay, that was just called in Mumble. Our time set right now is 6.04. Go ahead and hit play. You see the, you, or actually I'm going to pause it here again. You see the groups, how we have this set up right here. We have the group here where my mouse is, where the uh, X marker on the triangle raid mark. You have the melee, you have the tanks, and you have the other group of range. This is basically four possible locations for the shockwave to hit. All right. Now, you. that's good in the sense that you're going to have less movement by the raid, but it's horrible in the sense that it's going to be super fucking hard to top off four groups at a time. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and hit play. Like I said, that you heard the healers call out that they need they need us to restack. Okay, there's the one on melee. So they're basically um, there's the roar. Everybody consolidates on square. Of course, the Texas calls for square because that's where he's at. Uh, that's why people have to stack on square. Uh, Lord forbid the mage move. All right. So, anyways. We have everybody stacked up. We have one range group, one melee group, and then the two tanks, obviously. So we still have a triangle going on, which is still efficient, but it, it's better for healing. Here's a, here's, a, here's a prime example. You guys always ask, but Rig, why would I go leatherworking? All right, like, this is a reason you go leatherworking. Just shit like this is imperative. If it means saving somebody a tenth of a second on, you know, running out of that, I mean, like, who knows who, somebody could have gotten hit by that, and, you know, say a healer died right there. But because the healer group had drums, they didn't, you know. I mean, who did, they may not have, but if they did, this would have been a wipe. But because we, I mean, this is just an intangible part of leatherworking, you know, that's why you want to have that, all right. So that's why you guys see me promoting leatherworking all the time. Anyways, everybody ran out to the left, stops and nukes. We have a barrier up. You want to have cooldowns for these last two or three that go off. You've got DSAC, you've got Spirit Link, you've got Warrior Last Stands, you've got... Uh, the Druid four piece, Shield Wall four piece, you name it. You know, you've got you've got cooldowns. You need to make sure that you have them planned out for the end. All right. You see what's going on here? You've got the you've got the camp. The boss is just hitting. No tank. It doesn't matter really what you are. I mean, obviously RNG is going to allow tanks to live through it at times, but um, it's 15% move speed. It's not a lot, but it still helps. But what I'm saying here is, you know, basically 30% and below. The tanks need to have a cooldown up for tanking. All right, you need to be, 
just sitting with that shield wall on a hair trigger or excuse me or just anything really like you're going to be getting fucking destroyed all right well you can't i mean you basically yeah you got to have a cooldown up you got pain subs if you're if you're raiding with a holy priest you're just doing it wrong you know uh, ps is king and gs isn't going to do shit for you it's going to delay your death for about the amount of time it takes him to swing he's going to swing once kill you proc the gs swing again then you're dead a ps hands down better in every cat every area not to mention you get a barrier for the raid all right as I mean, knocking Holy Priest, I'm just saying, they don't have the, the uh, raid utility that a disc does. Um, and they can't offer the absorbs on the tank that a disc does. Um, so anyways, uh, you see Abs just died to the combo. I mean, it, it's brutal, man, at that, at that percent. So basically, if it, from 15% on, it's just me left. Uh, I had already died earlier, so that's both tanks that have basically died in this last phase. Uh, the, how I died earlier was a combo from the Disrupting Shout and then the Devastate uh, Sunder application. Um, it can all come down the pipe really quick. So what's going to happen here? We know we basically are going to have one more shock wave, one more disrupting shout, and you know we just have to live through that. So you hear Juvie calling out. He's going to use his raid last stand. Uh, you hear uh, Malady calling for the Spirit Link totem just for the 10% damage mitt uh, and things like that. So we're basically going all in at this point. There's the Spirit Link. There's a shock wave on a melee. And here we are on the boss, the last one. Everybody's good. And done deal. All right, so that was us. That was our first kill. I said we're going to go over some more POVs, nothing like that in depth. I just wanted to walk you guys through it step by step. I'm just going to highlight some other videos and things like that. So, I mean, that's the fight from start to finish, basically how everything works, how you need to react to it. And you can see at the end of the fight, the people that we have dead are um, Nadri, which are Shadow Priest, uh, Tank, which is Abs, and then Sparring, which was our healer. So our healers got big. I think they four healed the last phase, uh, which is really impressive. Uh, having that healer dead from the beginning hurt us a lot, uh, and that played a large part in tank deaths. So you hear me yelling because I, yeah, I don't know. That's just uh, what happens sometimes when we kill stuff. Okay, so anyways, that said, uh, I'm going to show you guys it from a 10 man perspective. And I'm going to show you guys just some different strats in 25-man perspective. Um, quick question. So Spartan didn't get denied. He actually made member. Uh, people die. I died. That doesn't mean that, uh, you know, you're bad. It's just uh, shit that happens and uh, things like that. So we're going to go more into into depth here. I'm going to go through 10-man POV. I'm going to go through different 25-man POV. And then we're going to open it up. You guys can ask questions. And you guys can uh, provide, if you've got, like I said, I'm going to cut to commercial real quick, but just to uh, get a drink of water and stuff. But if you guys have logs, videos, or questions, make sure you document those. And we're going to open up, like, the floor to you guys. The reason I'm doing this is for you guys. So get your questions lined up. And, uh, you know, I'm going to go over a couple more things, and then we'll cut to you. Alright, so commercial's over, sorry, I just had to get some water. I like talking a lot, but, uh... Alright. Alright, well, um... Real quick, let's see... This is... I'm gonna just highlight some stuff here. This is, uh, Paragon's 25-minute video. Okay, so... You can see that they kind of have the same, somewhat concept that we do, but they just do the ads a little differently, alright? So... You can see here they pull the two melee ads on top of one of the drakes that the side is on. Okay, this is also a viable strat. I'm going to go ahead and go over some pros and cons for this. If you pull the ads up here, more or less like how they're doing here, what you're basically doing, you're opening yourself up. For, I mean, you're going to have better damage. You're going to, you know, cleave is going to do really well. Uh, things like that. However, 
by doing this, um, if both mobs charge at the same time in the same direction, you know, we had a, we, you know, we tried this. We had a serious problem with people just getting gibbed and uh, things like that. So, um, you know, if you're strapped for DPS, this is more, this is a more aggressive strat. We went with the more defensive strat. Like I said, doing a better job soaking and just relying on just raw, just DPS. Uh, this is more of a, um, like I said, an aggressive strat. So you can see what they're doing here. They just tank them over here on the side, which allows like dot splash, all that shit to uh, to hit the mobs. And they group up, they leave the melee out, they don't have the melee come in and soak, which makes for more healing and things like that. Uh, and, you know, the you're basically getting more free damage out of it, again, more aggressive strat and things like that. But there are cons to doing that, which is you're going to make the healers have to work harder going in, coming out of the large one, because you don't have melee getting in to soak those. You're also going to have a lot uh, higher probability of people getting double charged and things like that. I mean, but if you can pull it off, by all means, there's, mo there's definitely more than one way to kill a boss. And this is a boss where there are different, multiple strategies or, op or uh, you know, um, that's a good word I'm looking for here. There's just multiple options for each uh, each way to, or this boss especially. Okay, so if we just fast forward through here. All right, you see them, they get them on this side and they pull them over there this time. They just cleave down on that side, things like that. They do a good job soaking. And then they just cleave them down. All right. So, I mean, if you got like combat rogues or things like that, this would be really efficient. Um, let's see. So that's more or less how they did phase one. The rest of it's more or less the same of what I've already shown you guys. Now I'm going to get to something they do differently in phase two. Okay. Here they get to phase two. They pull the boss onto the side here. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and make this uh, full screen for you guys. Okay, what they do, you can see here that um, the shock wave, I have it paused, the shock wave is on them. The, basically the way that they start, they decided to do this phase is they stack, they always move left for the shock wave, and then they move back to the right. Now, I'll go ahead and go through the advantages and disadvantages of this as well. Okay, you see them go over here for the shock wave, and then they run back. Okay, advantages of this, it's extremely straightforward, and... It's uh, even if there's fire all over the ship, there's never fire on the edge. All right, so this is all. This is something that will basically work regardless. But the downside to this strat is you're moving twice as much. You're moving out, and then you're moving back in. Okay, so um, that's if you've got the DPS to pull it off, by all means, go for it. It's uh, it's definitely an option. I'm just saying that it's less efficient than having people move in one way, and then once it's done. Or once they move, they stop, and then they don't move until they need to move again. They're yeah, they're basically moving twice as much. We'll go ahead and play and let it, let you watch through it one more time. There was a roar. Shockwave should be soon. Shockwave. They run out to the left. They got to get hit, and then they run back in. So yeah, I mean. It's not horrible, but it's it's just a little bit less efficient. They got the kill pretty quick anyways. That's just how they do the whole phase. So that's two different ways that you can do that part of the fight and um, things like that. So, uh, and there's also, you know, you could do what some guilds did and more or less cheese the fight all together, and that's uh, pull both melee ads inside the cabin and just, uh, you know, more or less um, exploit the... You know, lack of charge mechanic. You just pulled them in there, AOE or uh, cleave them down, and then came back out, and you never really had to worry about uh, the charge. So um, that's another option, but uh, don't have a video of that. I couldn't really find one. Um, so yeah, uh, let's see. Here is a ten man version of us doing the fight with commentary. I'm just going to link this for you guys. Uh, if you guys aren't seeing these links or just want to find it later on, it's on my YouTube channel. You see the button on the um, bottom of the page uh, for my YouTube channel. You can just go on there. It's Heroic Warmaster 10 uh, on alt. But, uh, it's I mean, it's more or less the anyway, same thing. It's doable with this comp. It's not a comp issue. You hear me at the beginning of the video basically bitching. 10-man, this fight is actually a lot harder than it was in 25, okay? Like, 10-man requires a lot more communication, and 10-man requires a lot more just... Uh, yeah, I mean, coordination all over, because you have the same amount of space, but you have less than ha half the amount of people to deal with it, all right? Like, 
you need to soak every single one possible on 10 man and you have to have everybody in the large ones on 10 man and things like that i mean one or two people out with cooldowns i mean you can make it work but it, it, it gets pretty rough as you can see here Uh, just go through a quick uh, preview of the first. Or here, here's the things I was telling you guys about. These are the charge icons that show where the mob is going to charge. If you see that, you have to run out immediately. Okay. Um, that is, you're going to take a lot of damage from that. You see a charge. I fast forward here. We have a large one hitting. You see your raid frames. That was with the cooldown up. Wasn't that bad. Okay. So. That's more or less it. The last phase is a lot of the same, but uh, this is definitely a fight where it's a lot harder on 10 man. All right, so that's more or less the walkthrough from several different POVs, several different uh, things like that. So um, I'm going to go ahead at this time and uh, I'm going to get some logs up, but I'm going to open it up to you guys and ask questions about the fight if you're having problems on it, uh, if you've got logs that you want me to look at, or if you have uh, a video that you want me to go over. But that's more or less what uh, the fight is, a lot of the ins and outs, and things like that. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and look through the chat here. You guys just ask questions uh, as they come to you. I'm only really going to answer the ones about the fight right now. Any of the off-topic stuff we'll deal after this session is over. Um, oh. Okay. I have 130 logs of lives to this fight uh, on 10 man, but it's 125 of people dying to barrage. Uh, yeah, man, the barrage is pretty rough. Um, if you want to, Lord Jeffers, if you want to elaborate on that, I could give you some tips maybe on how uh, how to uh, fix that. See, you killed this fight today on Heroic. Congratulations. Um, uh, how about moving together on the sides there? Looks like the same as the ship floor. Just left, right, left. Yeah, that would have been better. Uh, uh, Fujuki, I think is how you say your name. Yeah, that would have been a lot better for them to do, as you saw in their video, where they were moving left, or for the shockwave and then moving back right. If they would have just moved left, stayed left, and then moved right, that would have been better. Uh, they were just moving twice as much. I didn't really understand that as well, but, I mean, it worked. It's not that big of a DPS loss, but it is a DPS loss. Um, let's see... Any classes in particular you think are good for the fight? Uh, that's a good question. It just depends on your strat. A lot of the question, a lot of the, the a lot of the way the fight works is if you're going to use something like uh, I showed you guys in Paragon's video where they pull them over to the Drake and cleave them down. Things like combat rogues and, and like that'll be really exceptional for the fight. Um, if you have it kind of spread out the way that we did it, uh, stuff like uh, daughters, shadow priests, warlocks, moonkin. Uh, things of that nature were really, really strong. Um, just being able to keep damage going on all things at all times, uh, those are really good. Um, it was definitely a fight that favored range for the most part, um, unless, you know, you were doing the cleave strat, and then it, it favored melee to an extent, but range are still, you know, pretty pretty well off on that fight. Um is the fire on the side of the boat a bug, or how is it? I'm not sure what you mean. You'll have to elaborate on that. Uh, and on 10 Minch, how much health did you have left on your ship in your first kill? That's a good question. Um, I actually don't have a ship HP bar on our 10-man kill. This is our initial 10-man. Uh, actually, this isn't our initial 10-man kill. I could probably find that out for you. Um... We definitely had a lot more of a problem with the ship's HP on 10 man though than we did on 25. Uh, if that uh, if that does anything to answer your question, so you definitely have to do a lot more paying attention to soaking on 10 man. Um, how hard would I rate this fight? One out of 10. 
Uh, it depends. Like DPS requirement, I would probably put like maybe a seven. Coordination and communication, I would put it, you know, like an eight or a nine. Um, as far as complexity of mechanics, it was it wasn't anything really complex. You know, I mean, it was uh, pretty straightforward in that regard. So it just depends on how you're how you're more or less looking in terms of difficulty. It's hard, but it's hard for different reasons than other fights are hard. Um, what is be what is best to use DPS CDs on the first set of elites or the second? Definitely the second set. It would be better to use your cooldowns on that than the first set. The way the first set lines up is there's I mean there's no fire on the ship and uh, just you know trinket procs and all that. And, you know they're going to be going right then and the, you know the first set always tends to die well in enough time and the second set's where you kind of start to fall behind. So but at the on the flip side of that if you're using cooldowns on the second set you're going to have them up later in the fight instead of having I mean so uh, I don't know it just depends how your timings are lining up and things like that. Uh, how many healers do you need for this fight on 10 man? Uh, let me look at our log for this last week and I will tell you. One second. Ten man heroic for this past week. Our most recent kill. Let me go through some logs right here. Healing done. War Master, it's about a six minute kill, start to finish. Uh, two healers, okay. I just want to make sure uh, make sure it wasn't three. So yeah, two heal fight on ten man. You would probably get away with three healing at this point, but two heals should be plenty sufficient and things like that. Um, let's see. But with the BL tactic, they need to move too, even if the shockwave doesn't line up. Uh, I'm not sure what that means. If the shockwave isn't on you, you don't move. So, um, let's see. Do pallies suffer on this fight because they don't have a massive raid cooldown? No, AM is very useful for this fight, and it's a shorter cooldown. It's only two minutes, and you can AM the onslaught. Uh, you can also AM Devo at the end if you want to for the uh, disrupting roar thing. Is having one tank hold both ads and one tank running around soaking viable for 10 man? Uh, yes and no. I mean, if you've got the cleave to uh, accommodate that, you could. But uh, my advice to doing 10 man would just be split up quadrants. Do the the. I mean, you can just do. Um, six camps or four, I'm sorry four camps of like uh, two and then you have two healers kind of floating around um, it worked out pretty well for us let's see definitely harder with more melee yes some parts of it are uh, what do I think about single tanking every second ad pack the DK word uh, we did it uh, da, 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 da. I could still go to a three in a row by myself yeah you can I mean you can do that while tanking the ad too but if you've got good cleave you know yeah pull them aside each other and then one person can run around soaking I mean Whatever works, man. There's no right or wrong way. If you guys are making it work, that's definitely uh, if if you have a, if you have one tank solo tanking both of them and then one running around soaking with cooldowns and like TB trinket and things like that, uh, it's definitely something that sounds viable. I haven't done it, but uh, I mean it's uh, there's no reason not to. The only problem with that is if you have both ads stacked, you just have to be very vigilant on looking out for charges and things of that nature and making sure people don't get double charged. Um. If you're struggling on DPS, have ranged on top cabin at the start. Pre yeah, that's a good thing to point out, uh, Raid, Raiden, LOL. Um, you can have the ranged, so, uh, you can have all your range start out on the side or the top of the ship, and you guys can get a full set of dots on the drakes. So, I mean, that's just, you know, if you want to completely min-max, get them up there, pre-pot, have them uh, get all their dots rolling and things like that before the, as they're doing the initial flyover, buy you a little bit of DPS. Um... Would you suggest having a DK use AMZ for the barrage? Yes, I would. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, having a DK use AMZ is very, very, very efficient. Very efficient for the uh, onslaught thing because what happens is the way AMZ works, I'll just go over it real quick again. Um, 
it's going to, if you have everybody in it and it just takes one burst of damage, it's going to mitigate the same amount of damage from everyone inside, but it's if, you, if it's like a pulse, it's going to be less effective because it'll just get chewed away real quick, but the way that it works is it's the huge pulse, or I'm sorry, the huge uh, meteor that comes in and hits, so AMZ is really, really effective. Um, with a Baron a Prot Warrior, can you suggest how to rotate raid cooldowns? Uh, yeah, um, just set it down and map it out, man. Like, you want to get your shorter cooldowns up front, like your AMs and your shield wall in that case. You want to get those up front. Then you want to use, like, your barriers and your druid four-piece and things like that. Um, so, yeah, just make sure you have it in a macro, like, first uh, first on slot, these cooldowns, second on slot, those cooldowns, and so forth. You need to plan out for about five or six. So, uh, I think AM's up for, like, first and fourth, and then you can have, like, shield wall up for second and fifth, put the AM in, uh... I'm sorry, I've already said AM. Then you've got like the Druid for like the second, or I'm sorry, for the third, and you'll have it back up for the second phase, and then you just pretty much have to fill in one more. So, um, do you, do we need to use solo soakers with CDs, uh, TV trinkets, or can we just get in barrages whenever possible? Uh, you just want to get in barrages whenever your debuff's down and you're topped, more or less. And uh, use a part, if you go, if you go into an onslaught, with the uh, debuff on you, just pop a personal cooldown and things like that. Um, is the stack strap possible in 10-man? Uh, yeah, I think uh, it may be. We don't really use it, so... Um, yeah, that's. Uh, I really couldn't answer that. I've, uh, I haven't really seen a, the guy above you just said he linked a video of that, so we'll see. Um, Best two healers for this fight, uh, I wouldn't say Pally Druid. I would say Pally. I mean, Druid's really good because a lot of movement, but the Druid doesn't really bring anything to the table when it comes to um, mitigating any damage. But uh, I mean, they make it work. We did it with a Pally Druid. I just don't know if I would go as far as to say a Druid is optimal. I mean, it works. They, we were rotating Tree Form and uh, Trank for two of the cooldowns. Uh, we did Vamp Blood with each of those uh, when he would have. Uh, trank up, I would VB. Makes that extremely effective, as well as with tree form. Um, we have Blood DK, Prot Warrior, and Feral Tanks, which setup is better. Uh, I would say the Blood DK and the Prot Warrior, and then have the Druids DPS. You can always get the Druid 4 piece, even if you have the Druid DPSing. You just have them go into bear. Uh, and, you know, let the diva fall and then pop it, so. Um, with two melee on the fight, are we better off putting two melee on one drake or having them cleave the two melee adds? And what do we do with the sapper? Um, the two melee should be enough to, you know, nuke down the sapper, just get a slow on it with the tanks and two melee. Should be more than enough for the sapper. Worst case, have the range uh, switch to it real quick. But, uh, I mean, with only two melee on the fight, you want them focusing on the melee adds. Um, yeah, Center brought up a good point uh, about the uh, debuff thing going out in the last phase. Um, let's see. Um, we got... I pl okay, this guy says... I play a hunter. I'm all the time above our Shadow Priest and Fire Mage with Legendary. I'm single targeting. Are they doing it wrong? Yeah, probably. Uh, they are. They definitely should be uh, doing a lot of damage, especially if they have a Legendary on that fight. Um... Blood DK is far and above. I don't know about that, man. Blood DK's got their work cut out for him in the last phase. A block tank like a warrior, a paladin, is pretty strong uh, against Warmaster in the end. Um, and in the first phase, it doesn't really matter what tank you have. I, I would say a druid's arguably best because they're going to have the most DPS output or damage output, whatever. So, um, Let's see...
All right, so caught up with a lot of these questions here. Does anybody have like a log uh, or a video that they want me? Actually, let's go ahead. I'm going to, we got a video link up here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to feature this video during this highlight thing. This guy is from uh, Immortal Seab. Can you just tell us more or less like about, and then we've got, a, okay, boom. we got a video and we got some logs. So thanks for these two links. This guy is from Rehabilitation Clinic. Let's go ahead. This is a video that he submitted more or less for this uh, quick little interview. We're going to put it on 720p. We're just going to walk through this video, and I'm just going to basically evaluate, uh, you know, his guild's kill and uh, just draw some points on what I noticed, good and bad. Um, it says here this is uh, Frost Death Knight point of view, killed January 9th, uh, US 102, Realm First. So good job on the Realm First, man. That's good. It's always good to see people. Uh, competing for top server kills. All right, so let's get it started. Go ahead and go full screen for you guys. All right, I got a, I got a few vid links. I'll, I'll, I'll trim through a couple of them real quick. Let's go ahead and uh, I don't want to cheat anybody out. Okay, so this is what he was pointing out here. You more or less want to see everybody that can hit stuff from ranged. Um, you can get a little free damage in right here. All right, so... You see, it goes from 24.9 mil, you get about, let's see, so you got dots and stuff ticking, you get about uh, point, probably about half, uh, half a mil trimmed off, alright, so definitely not uh, obsolete by any means. Alright, so looks like they have, let's see here, they pick up both melee ads. Pull them near each other. Okay, you see the charge going out there. They do a good job of avoiding that. And the reason this this goes back to what the guy was asking here. Do you want to pop cooldowns on these and things like that? Uh, another reason you don't want to really pop cooldowns on these, um, you know, super huge cooldowns, is just because there's, um, yeah, I mean, there's just not much else going on right now. You've got you can focus a lot of damage onto these and things like that. So they pull them on top of the Drake. Okay, one thing about this is the tank is pulling the Dreadblade kind of through the raid, risking getting him cleaved there. Uh, you can disarm the Dreadblade. Uh, that helps out a lot, but, um, you know, uh, it worked out pretty good. They've already got the Drake down, and they have one add up, so this is this is going pretty smooth. So they're doing a pretty decent job soaking. They got these two Moonkin. Okay, you see right there, this is a good thing to note. Right here. Uh, their Moonkin runs in here and soaks that one, right? So, I'm assuming these two Moonkin are supposed to soak this. What happened is that guy got hit by the previous one, so he has the debuff. Okay, now, at this point, he basically, I, I don't even know, but I'm going to tell you this is probably what happened. He tells the other guy, hey, I can't get this one, don't go in there. So you see them both bail, and then that one hit. That's good, that's the way that it should be. That's good communication. What a poor communicating guild would have done would just be like, the guy just herp derp, there's a purple circle on the ground, let's just run in there and get it. And then that guy would have gotten annihilated because he would have been in there solo. But since they communicated, and you guys may think that that's something little, but on 10 man, that's what it all comes down to, is being able to soak those barrages and things like that. So, you know, that little bit of communication right there, having that on a consistent basis, is what's going to make the difference between just 100 wipes or, you know, taking 10 pulls to get it done. Because it's not, it's not very complicated. Okay. So you see they get both drakes down. You have a sapper landing. You don't want to put slows and stuff on the sapper. Because it immediately cloaks. And then you're going to have to redo it. Okay. Then this is when you want to use grip, stuns, and things like that. Um, they say boom. They get that up. They get in here. They get both sets of ads down again. Let's fast forward here. Okay. So they pull both near. Uh, these could be. I mean, this is good to an extent, but you could get these a lot closer. Like, if you're going to commit to this strat, you really kind of want the tank to pull them up on the edge, okay? And um, more or less be able to, you know, anything, any, it just, it's, it's better for cleave. Because right here, a lot of the cleave isn't going to hit from there to there. You want to get them up on the ledge. Not to mention, it, if there's fire here, you also, fire doesn't go on the edge of the ship. Okay, so... They got it here. The druid, the dru any of the tanks, you can see that tank soaked it solo, but he paid for it. I mean, look how much damage. A tank is going to be able to soak it solo with, like, bark skin, 
you know, TB Trinket, AMS, whatever, or anybody can soak it with AMS, but, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's a good job of that tank, noting that he can soak it solo. I got a sapper, good grip by this DK, and he gets on it, that's good. They get in the large one, and you want a roar coming out of that, that's what I mentioned earlier. I didn't really see a roar go up there, but I could have missed it. If they did, that's good. Uh, see the things, let's go ahead and fast forward, we more or less see how they're doing phase one. This is all good. Let's check out their transition. Okay. They got everything down here. Let's they got the boss landing. They got the druid pick it up. They, they did a really good job soaking with the fire. However, you see that their ship is at 4%. That's basically, you sneeze on it, and it's a done deal. Okay? But they made it. The key, it doesn't matter if it's at 1%, and... It doesn't matter if it's at 99%. As long as the ship is alive, when you get to the last phase, that's all that matters, okay? It's, it's, it's imperative that everybody involved with the fight understands that. You don't have to soak every single thing. You just have to make sure that you have enough left on the ship to get uh, to stay alive. All right, so here we see their transition. They get the Drake. They Basically, this is a pretty good tanky uh set up um, I would actually recommend instead of I mean because you see how hard it is to kind of see what the hell is going on here um, personally if uh, I was whoever was taking the Drake you would want to move back into here and then move over to here so it gets the Drake the hitbox is large enough where you're still going to be able to hit it and you don't have the Drake on top of the raid all right you're just making it harder for people to see what's going on all right so um, you can definitely move the Drake a bit for a little better positioning but, I mean, all in all, I mean, it's it's getting the job done. But uh, you you want people to be able to see what's going on. You see the, the wing and all this shit. It's uh, it's making people's lives pretty hard to see what's up. So, um, yeah, this looks pretty good. Let's see how long it, are they are about to get the Drake. All right, the Drake flies away. Let's see how they handle shockwaves. Looks like they're still kind of spread out. Okay, they, they're definitely spreading out here. That is um, not, I mean, if you've got the healing to keep up with it, it's just, it makes it really rough on healing. You kind of want to stack up and uh, just let the group healing and things like that. But, uh, I mean, in a 10 minutes, it's a lot less important than it is 25. Okay, so yeah, that's pretty much it. They spread out, move for shockwaves, and that's the duration of the fight. Let's see here. Good job. That's a pretty good entry. It's a very clean kill and things like that. Uh, let's see what else we've got questions for and stuff. Um, when the dragon and war master have both landed, it is important not to get any cleave onto a war master until the drake is down. Uh, I mean, you can put damage into Warmaster, but your number one priority is getting the Drake to fly away, all right? And the more damage you do to the boss, the harder he's going to start hitting. If you get him too low, he's going to siphon health from the Dragon. I mean, there's just no real benefits to doing damage to Warmaster until the Drake leaves, okay? So hopefully that answers that question. You want to focus on doing as much damage as possible to the Drake and the Drake only. Even if it's just keeping, you know, say... It, you know, one GCD every, you know, 30 seconds into War Master, I mean, that's still one GCD that could put forth to getting the Drake out of there because it's, it's pretty, your number one priority is to get the Drake out of there and just have you, the Raid, and War Master. All right. Um, we got to go through those logs, and I'm going to open up uh, one more vid here. Um, Nartana, Pandemonium 25, man. Good stuff. Oh, Windrunner, hey, what's up, man? I used to be on that server. I uh, know that guild. It's good to see you guys are still going. Um, let's see. Real quick, uh, while I'm doing this, we got a lot of people in here. This actually turned out to be pretty successful. Uh, I'm glad that it's successful. And like I said, we're going to take everything basically good from this week, and I'm going to put it forth going for next week, and we're going to have a different boss. And uh, I'll probably have a thread going either on Reddit or our BL forums or something, or Twitter, who knows, where you guys can request what fight, and that week's most requests will be what we go over. It, it's just a work in progress. Biggest thing, check back on this stream, and 
I will have the updates there. But what I'm asking you guys to do, more or less, is follow the channel. Please, if you haven't done it, click the follow button. And uh, if you want to subscribe or whatever, follow my Twitter. All the social media links are below on those uh, new buttons that I had uh, one of my buddies hooked me up with. So, um, you know, I enjoy doing stuff like this for you guys, and I want to keep doing it. But you guys got to help me help you, you know. Just follow the channel, please. All right? That's out of the way. Let's get back down to business. I'm actually going to do a quick commercial, and then we'll be right back. Yeah, some people don't see the commercial, so we just have to wait till it's done. Okay, commercial's over. Uh, here's a good question here. Um, when Shockwave comes up, should range stack with melee? No. You don't want that. You don't want them running in and then running back out because there's a there's an interrupt with anybody that's in a certain radius of the ball, so that's why you have the range standing back uh, on the outside. Um, can you show us real quick your size and Hagar? Like I said, I'm going to get to every one of the fights. Uh, it's just a one one fight per week. We may increase it to two times a week. I don't know. It just depends on how successful today worked out pretty good. We've had pretty much 400 sustained viewers. We even spiked up to like 500 there for a bit. So uh, we're going to keep going here. Um, all right, let's take a look at this video. Let's get it on 720p. Let's full screen it. Let's see what POV we got going here. This looks like a roge, a rouge, a roga. All right. Let's see. Actually, quick thing. First thing you're going to be looking for. Okay. You see that they have their range up here, dotting and DPSing Grona as she flies over. That's the one thing that you always want to have happen. So if you're doing this fight for the first time, or if you're, you know, um, have been doing it and just are running into problems, or if you're looking for ways to optimize, that's one thing you need to make sure you're doing. Make sure your range are on top of the cabin or on the side over here, getting dots and DPSing and things like that. And then have them run down here. They're going to lose zero DPS on anything. They're just going to gain. All right. Uh, both melee, m both melee add spawn. Looks like they're pulling him to the side here, where the Drake is going to be. That's good. I saw somebody use rocket boots already. It doesn't really make a lot of sense, but uh, you know, so be it. There's a charge. They moved out. There's a charge. They already had someone die to the double charge. I'm guessing. Um, so now you have the Drake coming in. A lot of cleave and stuff going up on here. Have an onslaught. Everybody runs in, but the melee looks like they vamp blood, and uh, I couldn't tell what the other cooldown was. It went up. So they're de they're using the uh, cleave strat. They've got both melee adds uh, about to die here, and I'm not sure if that other Drake went up with HP left. They killed this Drake for sure. Here's their sapper. Wait for it to reappear. There they go. Alright, another large one, Let's see what cooldowns I got going here. Rallying Cry was up for that, I think. Uh, no, it's a Shaman buff. Okay, so then they're cleaving again, so that's good. So they're more or less using the cleave strat phase one. That is fine. Right, we're going to more or less fast forward to their... Um, Phase change here. All right, let's go back. Here we go. We have their phase change coming up. Thing lands. You have all the range over there, DPSing the shit out of the Drake. That's good. You have the melee getting on the boss because there's not anything else to be on at the moment. Uh, actually, I don't know what you guys are. I mean, you have your your melee, and uh, these other guys are melee, and they're. You guys should definitely be on the boss right now, if anything. I mean, I understand that, like I said, damage to the boss is not a priority, but it's more of a priority than doing nothing. You know, you don't ever want to be there doing anything. I guess if you have the DPS to do it, though, that's fine. You're just going to make a... Uh, by doing damage to the boss, you're just going to make your tank start taking more damage. I mean, maybe that's the angle you guys are playing. I'm assuming so. 
Uh, we got three people dead already. Um, actually, let me see how many people died to that. Uh, actually, three people dead going into the phase already. So, um, let's see. Get the rogue going in now because the Drake is landing. Okay, and he didn't do any. Okay, so yeah, they're basically not doing any damage to the boss at all to avoid the tank. I guess taking any added damage. So that's the strat they're going with. That's different. I haven't really seen that, but uh, I mean, now with the you know with the nerfs and the things like that, you're going to be able to kind of get away with that and more gear and things like that. But uh, I mean, if you're super strapped for damage, you kind of want to be on the boss from the get go. Just not once the Drake is down, your priorities on the Drake. Okay. Um, so so they recovered here. They got a good transition, rather. Their tanks already at two stacks of Sunder, and they have another one at one. Okay, they have both tanks with uh, two stacks here, so. Okay, the one tank's about to fall off in six seconds. Let's see how they make their tank switch. This looks like their prop pally here, so this is good. Where is this guy's timers? Okay, I'm not really sorry. Okay, here we are. Wait. Uh, okay, he doesn't have a breath timer, so I'm assuming he is just keeping track of when the breath is internally in his head or something. Um, the key here with tank swapping, like I told you guys earlier, you want to make sure that you're not switching during a breath because you're just going to get, you know, minimum the other tank breath, you know, in worst case you're going to breathe on the entire raid. Um, so you see the thing going off here. You have the range basically stacked with the melee. They're pretty much going to push the Drake. There's the breath. Okay, there's the shockwave as well. Um... Let's check out the center stacks. Okay, basically, uh, oh wow, they had the other tank die. So this guy's tanking both. This guy tanking both? No, he's not. I thought this was the tank. I guess that's not the tank. Uh, looking for another set of center stacks to go up so I can tell which one's the other tank. Okay, they make the tank, sorry, the tank dies, or uh, sorry, the Drake dies. And let's see how they deal with this. Let's see how the shockwave goes out. If they're going to move. Uh, here we go. They spread out. A couple people got hit. Okay, and then they restack. Uh, this is, like you saw from the Paragon video, that works. However, you guys also understand that by moving out and back in, you're doubling the amount of movement that you need to go. All right? And I can... Uh, you know, you want to move out and then just stay there until you have to move again. Whether that's if you get everybody to move to the left, and then once everybody moves to the left. I mean, another thing to understand is, like, if you're stacked directly on one person, it's going to be an equal amount of movement to, to make. And if you're, like, loosely stacked, and it's on someone on the left edge of the stack, and somebody over here is going to try to move left, they're going to get hit. They're going to have to move right to get out. So it's imperative that you stack on one person as tight as possible, and you just move left or you move right and then you just stay there until the next shock wave. It's more efficient and there's just no reason not to do it. All right. So let's see here. That's how they're handling shock waves. There's a shock wave on melee. Lots less movement because they're in close. This is the way the angles are working. So they're going pretty smooth here. Just the same three people dead. They're you know, using raid cooldowns for these last few. Let's see here. They've got a shock wave coming up. Uh, they'll probably end up beating it and a disrupting roar. Okay, yeah, they ended up beating it. So that's a kill from Pandemonium on Windrunner, and uh, yeah, that's uh, that one was pretty pretty clean. I don't know, those three people were dead pretty much the entire last phase, so they made it a lot harder on the people that weren't. Um, check out some more questions you guys have, and then we're more or less going to wrap this up. I don't want it to really start going over more than two hours, and we're about twelve minutes shy of two hours. Um, Uh, you guys try to refrain from just calling people like newbies and things like that. There's a lot of people that don't understand what's going on just because they don't know any better. And that's the whole point of this stream is for me to explain and tell people like this is why you want to do it and things like that. So saying shit like people are noobs, that's not really helping anybody. Be constructive. All right, good talk. Thanks. Um, let's see. Um...
Okay, so yeah, caught up with you guys here. Let's see a couple more things. Um, oh, sorry, my webcam is blocking raid frames. Someone said, "I'll just put it down here." Okay. Um, yeah, the raid frame. Sorry, I uh, didn't really notice. That. I just saw that somebody said that. Uh, let's see. I'm going to go through one more time and just watch our transition and show you guys one more time how the, tra I mean, because the key part to the fight, the first, pay the first phase, there's multiple different ways to do it, and uh, any way you really look at the first phase, it's not that rough, okay? So what's going to happen, I'm going to walk through real quick the final phase uh, of the fight and just go over, we had a few people join and things like that. This is more or less. You see us phase change here. Uh, we have the ship is, you know, decent amount of health, not really that low at all. Um, what happens here, we, we have two melee adds still up. We have fire all over the place, okay? And keep in mind, this is week one. DPS was a lot lower than it is now. There's no nerf. There's not nearly as much heroic gear flowing around, things like that. So, I mean, this is, this is actually a good indication of what guilds with just lower DPS are going to be facing, all right? You're going to have a lot of fire up. You're going to have, um, you know, melee mobs still up and things like that. This point right here is more or less just get the Drake down and get the melee adds down. The one tank picks up the boss. The other tank is tanking both melee adds. Okay, both melee adds have to die before the Drake lands. That's what our priority is on. See, our boss is still at 99%. Our melee are killing the adds. At this point, Absalom, our prop paladin, picks up the boss and I pick up the Drake. All right, and the reason that I pick up the Drake is, uh, I mean, a DK with AMS and things like it's just a really good anti-magic tank, and the Drake, that's really its only threat. So you see me over here uh, with a circle tanking the Drake, uh, AMSing the breath and whatnot, and then we have Absalom uh, tanking the boss. And you guys notice how I was talking about positioning. You don't want to have the Drake on top of the raid, okay? Um, you can see the Drake, it's not on top of the raid. And then we have uh, we have the shockwave come out and we have everybody move together. We have a couple people split up. We went into, uh, that right there was just uh, against the plan. We had actually planned on moving in all one direction until the Drake left and then splitting into two, as you'll see happen right here. Uh, so again, we make a tank switch after the breath happens. I come over, I stand directly on top of Philip. He then, after after I get the boss, he then goes and taunts the Drake. And then neither mob really moves. There's no movement from anything, okay? Um, that's what happens. All priority at this point is on the Dragon. The only thing that you're really having hit the thing here is, you know, splash damage, cleave, whatever. You see it's at like 92%. Um, I don't remember if our rogues were combat or whatnot. And... Let's see. Let me fast forward here. This is okay. We had we had to do another tank swap between breaths. Okay, we have a shockwave here. Everybody's supposed to go out left. That was called. Okay, I can't even pause it. What the fuck. Okay, yeah, that was called. The moonkin was slow to react, and the moonkin got clipped. Um, let's see. Have another tank switch. We have the roar going out. A lot of people keep asking, why don't the range just stand into melee? That disrupting roar that just happened, um, that w that will interrupt your range and keep them from being able to cast. Okay. I'm gonna just uh, speed up here. Try to get to the point where the Drake dies. All right. So here we go. It's just us and the boss. And like I said, right here, we are. Um, going to split once the shockwave is on the range. We're going to try and split in two groups. So we only made it to this phase only a handful of times uh, prior to this point, and we had hit in rage. So what we were trying to do is eliminate as much movement as possible. So we were going to do two range camps instead of one, which means only half the range are moving. The downside to that is it's a lot harder for healing, okay? So what's going to happen here? Uh, you move out. You see Affinity who's frapsing. Move slow. Um, 